All right, welcome everyone. I am pleased to introduce our featured author this evening as we celebrate Orca Awareness Month. Linda Mapes is an award-winning journalist and author of five books, including Elwa, A w River of Reborn and, w and Witness Tree, Seasons of Change, uh, with a century-old oak. She lives in Seattle, uh, and today she'll be sharing uh, with us from this book, okay, uh, Orcas. Oh, there you go. <laughs> shared waters, shared home. All right, please welcome Linda Mapes. Hi, everyone. It's uh, lovely to be here. Thank you for that welcome to Charlie. Thank you to Village Books. I want to give a big shout out for the independent bookstores that grace our region. It's so fortunate to have these independent books for independent minds in a beautiful place like Bellingham. I wish I was there with you live. Um, hopefully those days will be back soon. I hope everyone's been staying safe and healthy and enjoying this spring. I want to talk a little bit about what we're going to do tonight. I put together a presentation for you of some of the incredible photos from this book that were taken uh, largely by Steve Ringman, my colleague at the Seattle Times. There are also remarkable informational graphics and maps in this book that were made by my colleague, Emily Eng at the Seattle Times. This book is, is really a, a culmination for, for me and for my colleagues. Uh, we at the Seattle Times wrote a series in the paper called Hostile Waters that you may have seen. It was a five part series that ran over 18 months, special sections, very unusual in American newspapers to see a presentation that big, that long, that sustained on a single animal, the orca whale. But the reason we did it was because the orcas are, are such an important animal in our region, because really they're about everything. They're about the water, they're about the land, and they're about the salmon, and whether the water and the land and the salmon are healthy, and in fact, whether we're healthy. Ultimately, if these orca whale families are doing well, we're gonna do okay too, and if they're not, that should be telling us all that we need to take better care of this region that we love and call home. That's the reason I call the book Orca, Shared Waters, Shared Home, because these incredible creatures, the Southern residents have been here for some 13,000 years. And when the first people of this region came, they were here to greet them. Some of the members of the Lemmy Nation tell me that they believe these orcas know their songs. And they consider them family members. They call them the Kolchamachtan, the people that live under the sea. So tonight I want to uh, share with you this beautiful book that uh, brings together these amazing photos by my, my colleague Steve and Emily's graphics. And this deep dive into the reporting that we did in Hostile Waters and then took even further into um, really the roots of this extinction crisis that's facing not only the orcas, but the Chinook salmon that they primarily depend on for their food. In the newspaper, we decided that, that we would uh, go big, deep and long on this story, that we would in fact go everywhere the Southern residents go in their vast foraging range from the west side of Vancouver Island on, around the Campbell River, midway up the island, all the way down to central California with stops in the Salish Sea and Puget Sound all the way down to San Francisco Bay, where these animals still go trying to find food, Chinook. We traveled by boat, we traveled by seaplane, we logged thousands of miles, and I don't even know how many people we talked to and how many documents we searched. It was important to us to understand what was going on with this precious animal that we all regard as uh, really, as an absolute icon of this region. You know, they've been listed since 2005 as an endangered species. The Southern resident crisis is not a news story, but it became new for me. And I'm gonna tell you how that happened. It all started in 2018. I'm gonna show you a little bit of video here about how this story started for me. In this video, I'm out on the west side of San Juan Island, which is a primary foraging range for the Southern residents. And I'm out with the Center for Whale Research, which is a nonprofit. And you can hear the cameras clicking in the background as they're documenting this pod. 
This is J-Pod, and it's a family within J-Pod that was in crisis. That summer, as we were watching, there was a mother whale in this pod that was carrying a baby that lived only half an hour. And even though that whale had passed on the little baby, she refused to let it go. She clung to it for days and days and days, 17 days, more than a thousand miles. And so I was out with the Center for Whale Research watching her with this procession of her family members, staying close by her, watching over her as she kept carrying this baby whale. And not only that, well, we didn't there was another small whale named J-50, not even three years old, who was starving to death right in front of us. Why? Why wouldn't she eat? What was wrong with her? All the other whales uh, were not starving to death. Similarly, what was going on with her? And there was an international rescue effort that was mounted to try to save her life. But ultimately, she died just a few, year, a few months later in September. So this was really a summer of crisis. Um, and it, and it it captivated the region. I'm going to tell you a little bit in this next slide about what it was like for me to be in the middle of this. Again, this is from this boat while I'm out with the whales. So I'm out with the Center for Whale Research on the west side of San Juan Island, and we're watching the saddest of sights. It's um, the family of J-Pod, and they're traveling very slowly, very, very tightly together with J-35. This is the mother who lost her calf after only one half hour of life, and she's been carrying it steadily since last Tuesday. This is Sunday afternoon at about 3.30, and she's still carrying it on her rostrum. And they all stay very close with her, very, very slowly moving through the water. It's a procession. So I wanted to show you that so you could get a little sense of what it was like for people, scientists and nonprofits, um, a journalist like myself who were watching all this going on unfolding in the summer of 2018. It, it really was a, a sense of crisis as this, this beautiful orca named Telequa was carrying her calf. And as you can see in this picture, you see that little tiny fin right in sort of the midsection of her body. That's actually the dorsal fin of the baby whale that she's carrying. And you can see something up there by her head that clearly is not her body, it's something else. Well, that's the calf. And, and she, that calf weighs about 300 pounds. And she has to make a decision every time she goes down whether to pick it up again when she comes up to the surface to breathe. And this is a photo that Steve Ringman shot. Uh, the two of us were out with uh, the SoundWatch Boater Education Program with Taylor Shedd, who took us out on the water to uh, observe her so that we could get a sense of what was going on as, as she was going through this crisis. And you know, Steve and I were out all day with Taylor on this little tiny open skiff and it was very, very hard to see her. It was very hard to see the calf. And in the very end of the day, you see the sunset light on the rocks. Uh, he shot finally one frame. This is it. <laughs> one frame. Took all day. And this became very much the iconic photo for the entire newspaper series and really for the book. Because you see this mother whale uh, with this calf. You know, we, we made a decision at the Seattle Times that we were going to stay with her every day of her journey. And when she finally... When it finally ended, I won't say when she finally dropped the calf, because I don't think she did. I think she finally just um, had to face it falling apart after 17 days. You know, when that journey finally ended, there were six million people watching, reading that story in the Seattle Times around the world. And, you know, we've never seen that much readership for any story at the paper. And I think I know why. You know, she was a mother who happened to be an orca. And anyone who'd ever lost anything in their life could understand what she was going through and feel for her loss. And, you know, talking with biologists who, who know the, the sociology and intellectual capacities of these highly social animals and others like them, elephants, uh, other very highly intelligent social animals know that they grieve, you know, when they lose a family member. And, and so it, it was widely understood that that's really what's going on here. She's grieving. Uh, and there was a lot of concern for her while she was carrying on like this, which, which was she eating? Was she going to be all right? This is a young mother. Would she, would she live in order to perhaps have more young in the future? So it, it was a story that really gripped the region and even the world. And, and I think too, that it was, it was unsettling because we're used to thinking of the San Juans as this beautiful tourist destination, you know, this classic 
sunset out on the boat, having a good time sort of place. And it is that, you know, it absolutely is. It is a beautiful place. You know, but what had gone so wrong? People were asking themselves that this animal, these southern resident orcas that had been using these waters as their primary summer habitat for 10,000 years, really weren't coming around as much anymore. They were arriving later and later, summer after summer. It used to be they came into um, the west side of San Juan Island and, and around the San Juans by May and were reliably local through the summer. And they even had a name for this maneuver that the whales do going up and down the west side of San Juan Island hunting for Chinook salmon that they're really um, chasing up to the Fraser River Delta just north over the border in BC, they called it the San Juan Shuffle because it was so reliable and such a rhythm of day-to-day -day life in the summer of the San Juan Islands. You know, why was it that suddenly they weren't coming until July? Uh, well, the reason was food, that there just really weren't the salmon there to sustain the presence of these families. And then when they did come into the San Juan Islands, they didn't behave in the same way. You know, they weren't lollygagging and playing and having super pods and breeding ceremonies, they were working, you know, they, they were spread out uh, foraging most of the time. It's a very different life for them now. They have to work harder to find food. You know, they, they depend on Chinook salmon. They've always depended on Chinook salmon and it, it made a lot of sense. They co-evolved co with these fish. They're the biggest salmon in the sea and they're abundant. They used to be abundant. And they're available year round everywhere throughout the orcas foraging range, all the way from Southeast Alaska to California out there on the outer coast or in the Salish Sea or coming from the Puget Sound rivers. There were always Chinook. You know, why would you choose a sockeye? So much smaller, harder to catch only around in the summer. No, a Chinook is what you're going to want. So they co-evolved to specialize hunting this fish. This fish that uh, was abundant but really isn't anymore. There are fewer Chinook today in the Salish Sea. There are fewer Chinook in Puget Sound. There are fewer Chinook in the Columbia Snake River system. There are fewer Chinook in the Central Valley, Sacramento system. Everywhere these whales go, these fish are either at risk of extinction or they're greatly diminished, not only in numbers, but in size. You know, people often ask me, well, why don't they just switch? Why don't they eat something else? Well, it doesn't work that way. You know, they, they, it's funny, you know, when they're born, they're a blank slate. Their mother teaches them what food is. These whales have culture just as we do. They are best thought of as societies of great antiquity, and they have deeply embedded cultural learning that they pass on generation to generation, what food is, what your language is in your pod, where you, where you forage for fish, where are the good spots. As people, we don't really know uh, what they say to one another, of course, or, or what goes on in their minds, but we do know this. They have one of the largest brains of any animal. We also know that the areas of their brain that are uh, in control of empathy and communication are among the largest and most complex of any animal, more so than in our own brains. We also know that they have large areas of their brain. We don't even know what they're for. All, all we know is that we don't have it. <laughs> whatever it is, you know, and, and, and when people say to me, oh, you know, they live in families, they have language, they, they're just like us. And I always kind of crack up and think to myself, well, don't flatter yourself. Not really. You know, these animals in many ways are far more successful than humans. They, they stay in their family groups for life. The uh, families never separate under any circumstances which is pretty impressive when you think about, you know, getting through a long weekend when you're with your family, <laughs> for a lot of people, um, they stick together, thick, thin, good times, bad forever. Uh, the kids never leave their mothers lifelong. Uh, not only that, but they share space with other types of orcas in the Northeastern Pacific. They're the Southern residents. They're the Northern residents. They're the offshores in the outer coast. And they're the transients or bigs killer whales. All these are, you know, different whales that they don't interbreed with, they don't interact with, but they share space peacefully with. They they don't go to war, they don't fight, and and they don't fight with one another. Violence between orcas is almost unheard of. And so you think about their ability to coexist with one another and with different types of orcas and with other species in the sea over thousands of years, and you have to be impressed. Not only that, but um, 
you know, they're the top predator in every ocean of the world. And this this business of specializing in Chinook salmon, that's not just a Southern resident thing. First of all, the Northern residents are the same animal. They also specialize in eating salmon. And we'll come back to them in a minute. But, you know, everywhere orcas live, they all specialize in something. The transients, for instance, they specialize in marine mammals, seals, even baby whales, uh, sea lions. They can take down a thousand pound sea lion, but they won't eat a salmon. No, just like a southern resident will not eat a seal. They can kill it, they can hunt it, and they've been seen even packing them around under their pectoral fin, but they won't eat it because it's not their culture. And this is the way of orcas everywhere in the world. There are orcas uh, in Patagonia that specialize in snatching baby seals right off the beach. They've taught themselves this incredibly risky feeding strategy where they literally storm the beach and grab a baby seal and catch the tide on the way out. Uh, there are orcas that eat the livers of great white sharks. There are orcas that eat stingrays. There are orcas that chase tuna to death. So specialization, that's, that's what orcas do. And in the Pacific Northwest, that specialization for Southern residents, it's always been Chinook. So this book and this story is really about these twin monarchs of the Salish Sea, the Southern residents, and the Chinook salmon that they depend on. And what we did was, was really probe to the roots of what is it? You know, why are the Southern residents and the Chinook salmon in decline? And I think that, you know, for us, part of this meant also, of course, looking at us, people. We're, we're part of this same ecosystem that they're in. And so you can't think about the world of the Southern residents without thinking about us and how we have affected them in just the short 150 or so years that uh, the settlers have, you know, first came to Washington state and began transforming the lands and the waters of the Salish Sea. And so what we did at the newspaper was we decided, first of all, to go north, to go up to uh, the Broughton Archipelago, which is on the northeast end of Vancouver Island, and go be with the northern residents. As I said earlier, this is the same animal. It, they also are families and organized into family units. They share language uh, across pods as, as the orcas that we know do, and they eat salmon. That is their food, preferentially Chinook. But what's different about the northern residents? Well, for one thing, there are a lot of them. And they're growing in population every year. There are about 300 Northern resident orcas and they have lots of babies and more every year. When we went up to uh, go explore their world and understand what was different about it, basically as a control group, if they're doing well, what was different? One of the things that so struck me as a reporter was every time I work with scientists uh, in the San Juan Islands or elsewhere in Washington or California, the big crisis was, well, would we, would we even see orcas? Would we be able to get pictures of them? Would we be able to spend time with them? Would there be any at all? Whereas up there, uh, we ran into them everywhere we went. We saw them everywhere. Uh, they're just there. And they should be there. That's the point, isn't it? These are their home waters. They're supposed to be there. It was a reset reminding me of what normal looks like. They're supposed to be all around. So we spent time in their habitat um, appreciating, first of all, their power, their eminence, their grace, their athleticism, of course, their incredible beauty. We spent time with Paul Spong, who runs a nonprofit called Orca Lab, and he's been there for decades. Uh, he's very interested in the sounds that orcas make and their language, and he has um, devices under the water to passively collect the sound of these animals in the Johnstone Strait and beyond. He also has cameras underwater so that you can non-invasively observe these animals. And what I learned from Paul, uh, who was one of the first to begin to understand the intelligence of these animals, is is several things to to include that these animals have a very different life up there. I mean, the northern residents take a look at that background. They they live in a place a lot more like much of Puget Sound used to be, cleaner water, quieter water, a greater variety of fish to choose from, 
and more fish. In fact, a lot of the fish runs that leave the Columbia River and other rivers here in Puget Sound, they turn right when they when they hit the salt water and they head up to where the northern residents are. So they're getting first crack at those fish before the southern residents even get them. You know, and the southern residents, um, they're living not just in a different place, but in a different world. Look at this tree. Uh, this is right behind Orca Lab out there on Hanson Island. And it's a remote island with gigantic old trees, much as used to be around Puget Sound country uh, before it was all clear cut for our settlement. But you know, a lot of this ecosystem is still intact up there in these more remote islands. It's just more remote, it's quieter, it's cleaner, more fish. This is the Johnstone Strait, and we're looking across with these volunteers for Orca Lab to a very special place called the Michael Big Reserve. And this is something that the northern residents have, but the southern residents don't. It's this place where only the orcas go. There's no, um, you're not allowed to have any boats in there, no people, not even kayaks. The only boats that are allowed are, are sockeye fishing vessels for a short period of time in the summer. And they use this area very in a very special way. The, the northern residents um, have a habit that isn't seen in the southern residents. They love to rub their be their bellies and bodies on the beaches, pebble beaches, and they they scooch down low on the stones and they scratch their skin and they socialize and they have fun and play. You know, it's a special place just for them. And these rubbing beaches uh, are thought to have been used by these societies for many thousands of years. And it was set aside as a place just for the whales. We don't have anything like that for the Southern residents. And, and so life for them always means life with us. And, you know, these are the most, the Southern residents are the most urban orcas in the world. I, I think about all that they've had to contend with as our population has grown by the millions. And so after our time up in, uh, the northern residents territory, we came back down to Puget Sound to explore the world of our whales, as I think of them. You know, they're not really our whales, they're, they're sovereign beings living in their own territory for their own reasons. But, but here in, in the Seattle region and in Puget Sound and northern Puget Sound and the Salish Sea, we think of them as ours because we love seeing them. And, and here they are, you know, I'm out on a NOAA research boat here with Brad Hansen and we're we're taking samples uh, when we can of scat from these whales uh, and, and Brad is observing them for their body condition and their health. This is right in central Puget Sound. This photo was taken by Steve Ringman, not far from the old Asarco smelter site in Tacoma and Commencement Bay, which is a super fun site is, is just a little bit south of where you see our boat here. And, you know, the, these whales, uh, I like to say, you know, they're not some crybaby species. They don't, they don't need perfection. But, but they need food <laughs> and they need to be able to access that food. And this is where the issue of noise comes in. You know, all, all the industrial noise now in our ocean from ferries and from big ships and, and even recreational uh, boat traffic if people don't keep their distance and don't keep their speed down. Um, you know, it, 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 why does that matter? It matters because whales are acoustic beings. They see with their they don't see with their eyes the way we do. Their vision is very sharp, but remember, it's dark in the ocean. And so they, they hunt by sound. They see with sound, if you will. They have this miracle ability called echolocation. It's even more sophisticated than sonar. It's a little like sonar in the sense that they're sending out a beam of sound from their head in order to image an object, but they actually see inside that object. They can, they can tell the size and shape of a swim bladder and a fish right in front of them. So they know whether it's a Chinook they want to chase or a little sockeye they don't want to bother with. And so they, they use sound to hunt. Sound is everything to them. It's also how they communicate with one another, how they stay connected in a dark ocean over vast space. It's how they tell one pod from another, one species from another. They would never mistake an orca from another pod as one of their family members. And so sound is their whole world. And to the extent that we obscure that sound, it's like putting a mask over the eyes of someone trying to find food in a grocery store. I can remember talking with Marla Holt at NOAA who has studied the effects of noise on whales and foraging. And she said, you know, picture yourself in a grocery store and you turn out all the lights and, you, and the shelves are half empty and you've only got a few minutes to find the food that you need. Well, that wouldn't work very well, would it? That's what's going on for these whales. There's, there's fewer fish, 
the fish are smaller. And then when we make noise that overlaps with the frequencies that they need to hear, it's also harder to catch them. So noise is a problem because Chinook are a problem. And these threats commingle, you know, the, the, the diminishing amount of fish, the noise that makes it harder for them to catch. Well, what happens then? They start to go hungry. And when they go hungry, just like us, you know, they're not fasting adapted. They need to eat every day to be in good body condition, to be healthy, and certainly to reproduce. And I mean a lot. They need hundreds of fish every day, each animal, depending on their body condition and their, and their age. For instance, a lactating female needs even more. But, you know, they, if they get hungry, just like us, they burn their fat. Well, that adds to the toxins that are, that are held in that fat. It adds to the amount of toxins that are circulating in their blood. PCBs and other industrial pollutants, you know, when those are released into their blood, and it, it can really play havoc with their reproductive system. It can suppress their immune system. And so these three, these three threats of um, inadequate, unreliable sources of Chinook, noise, making it harder to hunt, and then pollution, that, that's really what the problem is for these whales. At least that's the emerging understanding, kind of the state of the science today. We're always learning more. There's a lot of work underway now to, to think, well, what else could, could it possibly be? Is there some kind of um, illness we're not aware of, some kind of microbiome biome disruption? There's there's a, a lot of research underway to keep trying to understand what's bothering these whales. But for sure, we know one thing. They need to eat and every day. So I, w I want to stress that, um, you know, these whales, <laughs> they, they really are a magnificent species. I mean, I told you they're the top predator everywhere that they live in the ocean but but let's let's also talk about their athleticism i mean they they can leap they can burst swim up to 35 miles an hour they they swim 70 miles a day they dive hundreds of feet and you know this business of hunting it, it's not simple it chasing a chinook salmon and catching it with your teeth it, it's no easy matter you know, they, they dive hundreds of feet, they, they stall and they accelerate and they twist and they dive, you know, but, but once they get there, once they clamp onto that, that fish, they have what it takes. These are, these are the teeth of southern, of a northern resident orca named Namu. He's a very famous whale. He was the very first captive performing whale uh, ever in the world. And he was in Elliott Bay at the Seattle Aquarium, no relation to Seattle's aquarium today. Uh, he was only there for, for about a year, and then he died of the pollution in Elliott Bay, where we used to dump raw sewage until finally building decent sewage treatment. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's terrible to think of uh, the raw pollution that just a generation ago was, was placed in Puget Sound. But take a look at those teeth. Look how big they are. Look how sharp they are. I've held those teeth in my hand. Uh, they, they're dense and heavy as marble, and they're just ready to rip, you know, ready to shred these these um, these killer whales have that name for a reason. They're not sea pandas. <laughs> They're predators, absolute um, consummate predators. And, and, you know, showing you the next slide brings up a difficult time in our history with these whales. This, this is a totem pole that was carved by the Lummi, by Lummi Nation carvers. And um, this is a totem pole that's, that is carved in honor of Tokatai. Well, who's she? She is the last Southern resident still alive and still in captivity at the Miami Seaquarium. And she's been there for more than 50 years. And that's because in our state, um, it used to be legal, believe it or not, to actually hunt Southern residents and uh, just, you know, hunt them. <laughs> and, and the reason people hunted them was because they could sell them to aquariums around the world for enormous money. And, um, you know, this, this started off right here in Seattle and um, started out with a man named Ted Griffin, who, who, who got Namu down here. And it started this, this craze for captive performing killer whales. And suddenly everybody wanted one. And, and Puget Sound became the worldwide source of supply. And this, is, this took a third of the pods. You know, these whale catchers would... Um, net off the coves of, of Puget Sound and, and corral these whales into these coves and, 
and peel off the young ones because they were the cheapest to, to ship. Um, and what is so sad to me is the the whales they let go uh, wouldn't leave, even though they could leave, they stayed and, until the very last uh, moments with their young that were being taken away. And they never ever lashed out or or bit or attacked these people, even as they were taking their young and I mean, one of the paradoxes of the capture era is, is it was this era where people for the first time saw these uh, orca whales up close and un came to understand their nature, their intelligence, their sophistication, their gentle manner, um, and, and went from an animal that was reviled, hated, loathed, uh, shot on sight, to an animal that was beloved and eventually protected. It was, it was in 1976 that state officials uh, came together, the late Slade Gorton, who was attorney general at the time, uh, Ralph Monroe, uh, who was a seven, who, who served many terms as secretary of state, uh, got together with former Senator and Governor Dan Evans to shut it down and shut down the very last whale hunt ever in America, saving the whales. Nobody had ever done that before. This was totally new. Um, but it was part of that era of environmentalists of environmentalism in the 1970s, which is also when we passed the Endangered Species Act and so many other um, fundamental environmental statutes in our country. And so the capture era ended then, but not until we'd lost a third of the pods and really an entire generation of young. And Tokatai today is still in captivity as I said, for 50 years, more than 50 years. And she's believed to be an L pod whale. We don't know that for sure. Uh, and her family is still out there. You know, the rest of her family is still out there. She lives alone in a tank. It's the smallest tank of any uh, captive whale kept anywhere in the country. And uh, the Lemmy Nation uh, keeps fighting to re for her release. They they are joined by various nonprofits and others who want to try to set her free. The uh, Sequarium maintains that they take very good care of her and they'll never let her go because if they did, uh, they'd, she'd come back here to a place where the environment's compromised and her relatives are fighting for survival and also concerned that she would not survive the trip. So that fight goes on. It's not over. So what's it really about? The capture area is over. Um, why are these animals still declining 40 years later? Well, this is the reason. So this is central Puget Sound. This is the Green River. It's actually an important source of salmon, Chinook salmon, for these whales, as are many ri rivers in Puget Sound. Um, but take a look. I mean, this is now a warehouse district, one, the second largest warehouse district on the West Coast. And these warehouses have been built on what was beautiful farmland and beautiful forests. Uh, it, it's one of those things where we swapped our prosperity for the natural wealth of this region. And our prosperity has come at a price of these salmon. And this is obviously a very highly altered system. Uh, this is not going to be restored back to um, any kind of natural system. There are too many people, too many, too many uses, too much economic value. Um, you know, a lot of it, a lot of that area actually looks like this, where it's completely scalped with the trees and you've got a bike path and you've got parking next to the river. You can imagine the river temperatures in the green in the summer, uh, too high for salmon. Salmon suffer in temperatures that are above 68 degrees and that happens routinely in the lower green. The Muckleshoot Indian tribe in King County have been uh, fighting to try to improve conditions for salmon. And there's a big ongoing debate about um, what should happen with the rest of the river that doesn't already look like this. There are places that have not been armored and put in straight jackets of levees you know, is there a way to manage uh, flooding in those regions uh, without building more concrete walls? And that debate is very much underway. And so the future of this river, um, you know, is in the balance. Will it get better? Will it get, get worse? It can look like this. I mean, this is a, a, a spot in the upper river. And it, as you can see, is, is pristine. It's a beautiful spot for salmon. And but there's just one problem, the Howard Hansen Dam, which sits blocking 50% of the habitat of the Chinook in this river and all of the best of it. And the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which operates that dam for flood control, has been under orders from 
um, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration for years now to provide fish passage at the Howard Hansen Dam. Uh, but it's it's slow. The first time uh, the Corps worked on it, they busted their budget and ran out of money. And now they have to go back to Congress and get a new appropriation. And the years go by and, and the fish still can't access this, this critical, beautiful habitat. So, you know, there's, what's it about? It's about uh, how we've altered the watersheds so that these fish can't go where they need to go. They don't have the cold, clean water that they need. What else is missing? Food. Food for them. It isn't only about food for the orcas, it's about food for the fish that feed the orcas. It's all connected, isn't it? This is my hand. I'm on a research vessel out on the outer coast of Washington. It's called the Shimada. It's a premier research vessel owned by NOAA Fisheries. And we were out doing a survey uh, with scientists um, who are looking at the, at the Columbia River plume and trying to assess the conditions limiting the survival of salmon from the Columbia and Snake Rivers. And I'm holding a herring in my hand that we brought up in the, in the survey tow. It's, see its beautiful colors, what a beautiful fish. Herring is an absolutely, absolutely essential forage fish. This is the fish that feeds the salmon, that feed the blackfish. And, and they spawn on natural beaches. They spawn on eelgrass beds. And so it's all connected from the estuaries to the beaches. You know, if you bulkhead a beach, you don't have a natural beach anymore. And so that starves that beach for sediment and the eelgrass that those little herring need to lay their eggs. Um, you know, it, it all starts to unravel the connections between the uplands and the beaches and the near shore and this forage fish that feed the salmon that feed the blackfish. So think about that. You know, if you're if you're a property owner and you have the possibility of taking out a bulkhead on your property, or if you just purchased property in the San Juan Islands or elsewhere, and you have an option to leave a beach natural rather than develop it, you know, that's every one of these actions has an impact on the environment and and the beings that are already there before we showed up. And these fish, whether they're smelt or their or their herring are absolutely crucial to the survival of salmon that feed the orca. There's an old saying, little fish feed big fish feed black fish and you know they all these little fish need natural beaches for spawning. I I want to um say that things have been looking better for the southern residents lately. Uh, John Durbin and Holly Fernbach, who do surveys of the Southern residents by drone photography in order to assess their body condition. Recently, I wrote a story in the Seattle Times uh, on their findings that uh, JPOD overall, in general, was looking better than they'd seen them look in, a, in about, in, in quite a long time, at least 10 years, maybe longer. Well, that was sure good news that it looked like they were plumping up. There have also been some babies born. We've had five births to the Southern residents in the last two years, including to Telequah. She has a new calf. And I, and I think that um, all of us need to root for that calf and we need to have a sense of ownership with its survival. You know, may that calf live. <laughs> if that calf lives, we must be doing something right. Um, I love this picture because of several reasons. One is the baby calf you see here is, is carrying a salmon. What's it doing? I mean, it, it's too young to eat a salmon. This calf is still nursing. Uh, it, it's to me, it's like a, a human infant carrying a teddy bear. I mean, is it or is it teething? Is it learning how to be a grown-up whale? It's just beautiful to see this behavior already expressed at such a young age. And and I love the mother and calf bond. This photo was taken by uh, Andrew Trites. He's a researcher at University of British Columbia and the lead killer whale scientist there. And he described how when they were out on their research cruise with, with the Southern residents uh, that summer, which is 2019, they were just blown away by the beauty of what they saw and in the interactions between these families. You know, that's, that's the thing, you know, these are families. It's not random black and white wildlife. These animals have close family bonds and long lived, uh, long lived families and they stick together for life, as I mentioned. And, and I, and I think that, the right way for us to think about them as, is as societies, that these are really societies of great antiquity. I like to think about L25. She's my totem animal. She's the oldest Southern resident. She may be the oldest orca that we know of in the world. There she is. She uh, was seen in 
in the summer of 2018 down in Monterey Bay, for heaven's sakes. So all the way down in California, she's down there with a whole family. What's she doing? She's looking for food. She's looking for winter Chinook. And, you know, she was born in 1928, we think, uh, which means she was born before any of the dams were built on the Columbia or Snake Rivers. She was born back when the population of Washington State was about a million and a half people. She was born, in other words, when Washington State was a very, very different place. And, you know, she's down in California looking for winter Chinook because that's where her grandmother took her when she was a young whale. And it's where her mother took her, showing her where the good places were for fish. These are matriarchal societies. And we know that um, these Southern resident whales have, there's something very unusual about them, which is that the females have a very long postmenopausal life phase. This is very unusual among animals. There are only about six mammals in the whole earth that have this postmenopausal phase, including humans. Well, why? What's the survival value for the Southern residents for these old lady whales to persist decade after decade? It's because of their knowledge their vast ecological knowledge. And it's been shown, scientists have learned that particularly when fish are scarce, it's, it's the matriarchs who lead the pods to fish because they know where to go, or at least they think they do. I mean, one of the poignant questions in my mind about an animal like L25, when she goes down to California because she was taught to do that by her family, by her mother and her grandmother before her to catch winter Chinook, is she actually getting any fish? Or is she just chasing a memory of fish? Winter Chinook today are, are one of the few species that are as endangered as the Southern residents. Uh, NOAA lists 10 so-called species in the spotlight, just 10. These are the most endangered animals they protect. Well, two of them are Southern resident orcas and winter Chinook. Winter Chinook uh, rear and and return to the Sacramento River in the Central California, um, Central Valley. This is a highly, highly altered river with enormous water withdrawals for agriculture and for people. Uh, Shasta Dam built more than 600 feet high, one of the highest in the Western Hemisphere with no fish passage. Uh, they have no access to the cold water habitat that always worked for them. You know, the, you say winter Chinook, how does that work? Well, these, these fish actually uh, staged offshore and, and entered the river when it was colder in, in winter, and then they would head up into these high mountain spawning areas and escape the high summer temperatures. Well, they can't do that anymore. So they're, they're stuck with trying to spawn in, in the lower valley, uh, and, it, and the water just gets so hot. So they make releases of water from Shasta Dam, but so much water is taken for agriculture that the pool of cold water for those fish is steadily shrinking. Not only that, but climate is changing, as you well know. And so they've had these punishing, punishing droughts in California. And, and in those years in particular, these winter Chinook have just about almost uh, been wiped out. They're having a very tough year this year too. And so you see an animal like L25 and her family going down there to feed and you just think, what is she even getting? Is it just habit? Is it just uh, her culture that's taking her to a place that can no longer sustain her? This is what biologists are worried about, that these animals are suffering what's called a serial failure, not just a failure of salmon runs in one river, but in multiple rivers, the Sacramento. So what happens next? They go up to the Columbia, where the Snake River Chinook are among the most endangered in the Northwest. These interior Columbia Basin fish used to be the producer of 40% of the Chinook in the Columbia Basin, and today the Snake River runs are headed to extinction. And climate warming is uh, making it even tougher for those fish. Scientists have recently punished a published a paper that looks at sea surface temperatures and extrapolated the effect uh, into the future on Snake River, Spring, Summer, Chinook, and found that those, those animals will be extinct if, if we don't do something um, big to change their survival at every life stage. That means every life stage. That means in the freshwater habitat where, they're, where they spawn and rear. It means in the estuary uh, where they have to go through a dramatic body change before they can go out to salt water. And it, and it means understanding their lives better in the sea where we have very little understanding of where they go and what happens to them. And so, you know, this, these salmon are under great stress. 
I show you this picture because to me it's a little bit of a time capsule. This is uh, San Francisco Bay as seen from the air when when Steve and I were flying in to go look at the lives of winter Chinook and the orcas that that prey on them. You know, I looked out the window and I said, Steve, you've got to take a picture of that. We were freaking out. It's like, God, look at the scale of development here. This is the bay. This is this used to be an estuary. I mean, this is a thing that Seattleites and, and other people around Puget Sound need to look at because no, we're not here. We don't have this 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 amount of development in the Sailor Sea yet or Puget Sound, but you know what? We're headed there. Everyone's gonna wanna come to Washington State as climate change makes everywhere else too hot. We're gonna have the last fish, the last good fresh water, the last cherries, the last everything. More and more people are coming here and they're gonna keep coming. And so we need to think about this. You know, are, are we going to be a place where salmon and orca can survive? Or are we gonna turn into this? I'll tell you a story when Steve and I uh, had finished reporting one day in the Sacramento Valley, you know, we'd been out all day on a boat with a biologist for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. It was like 105 degrees. <laughs> it was so bad. You know, everything happened first and worst for salmon in California. That's where the first and biggest industrial hatchery operations happened. It's where uh, climate change is already bearing down the worst. It's where um, the, the fishing exploitation historically was just out of control. It's where the mining uh, with the gold rush destroyed uh, so much habitat. Um, the native people were completely displaced. The tr they, there wasn't the same kind of treaty making process there that has helped protect the landscape and the waters here in Puget Sound um, by honoring those treaties. And so, you know, California is a cautionary tale for us. We, we have to understand that uh, this is about stepping back and making space for these whales and for these salmon, basically to let them win. And you, and if we do that, you know, we'll be one of the first places that's ever managed to share prosperity, not just keep it all for ourselves, but maintain a place where these animals can coexist. It's a challenge of coexistence. And why should we bother? Well, to me, this is why we should bother. You know, this is, this is the magic of living here. I, I was out on a research boat again with Brad Hansen uh, in the fall. This is in the fall of 2019 and the Southern residents were in town, all three pods, J, K and L pods. And I get a call, I'm in the newsroom and it's Brad and he says, hey Linda, I'm going out to do a health survey with the Southern residents. Do you want to come? I'm like, are you kidding? Of course. <laughs> so Steve and Ramon Dampour, our videographer and I, we head out to West Seattle to the Don Armini boat ramp, which is just an absolutely ordinary uh, city park to go and get in uh, Brad's inflatable Zodiac and head out and go be on this survey. And what was so incredible to me, frankly, was that we were right here and they were right here. And, and it was so fun to see people coming out onto the beaches of West Seattle and in Maury Island. And, you know, they're there with their dogs and their kids and everyone's pointing and shouting. It's the enchantment. It's the enchantment of Puget Sound and the fact that these whales are still here. These beautiful waters and forests and, you know, so much of this region is, is still so unspoiled or can be recovered. You know, that's the lesson of our work that we've already done on Elwha Dam, still the biggest dam removal ever anywhere in the world. And those Chinook salmon are coming back uh, by the thousands. This is work we've done all over the region and we know that it works. So, so to me, there's reason for optimism. It is not too late. We know what to do. Everywhere we've done it, it's worked. We just need to get busy at doing a whole lot more of it and raising the money to do it. We need a dedicated fund to pay for habitat. And so with that, smack of a fin, <laughs> I'd love to hear your questions and um, just encourage you in, in the fight for, for whales and for salmon because, you know, these are the first some of the first animals of the Pacific Northwest. They have a right to be here. And, and to the extent that they continue to do well, our own society will flourish as well. Thank you, Lan. Uh, thank you, Linda, so much. Um, You're welcome, yeah, Shelley. That was, that was wonderful. Um, I I don't see any questions, um, but to, to the audience, feel free to type any questions you have still, um, not too late. but. Um, there is a comment from Lisa. Uh, she says, thank you so much for all your work to bring the issues of orca salmon in the Salish Sea to our communities. Um, the Northwest Straits Foundation is one of the several organizations around the region working on these issues. 
and she sends um a link to two videos um about the shorelines um coastal uh one is called videos shore friendly living coastal beaches and bluffs and then managing shoreline erosion bulkheads or natural solutions oh and there's a third one actually restoring the connection between land and water great um, so it sounds like um as you said it's we can still coexist with these orcas even as we continue to um our population continues to grow um, yes we can it's um, all about making these choices and um i just want people to feel encouraged that it is not too late and it's far from over i mean there's so much that we have done and that we can do and um you know i'm very inspired by what by the success of of the elwa dam removal but you know there there's a lot of uh, sort of deadbeat infrastructure out there that was built in the 1900s, 10s, 20s that nobody even needs anymore. And it's just a matter of money to um, to take that infrastructure out. Enlo Dam, it's sitting on the Similkameen River in central Washington, hasn't made a kilowatt since 1952. Nobody even wants it. But the <laughs> Okanagan PUD can't afford to take it out. You know, I, I talked to one of their commissioners. He was hilarious. He said, you know, I used to say I'd take a nickel. Now it's down to a penny. <laughs> <laughs> So that's that's where um, you know the community needs to step up and step in, and we've seen this elsewhere, and it's really worked. I mean, right there in Bellingham, you saw the restoration of the Nooksack River, where the city of Bellingham partnered with American Rivers and the Tulalip tribes, and the state legislature pitched in 10 million bucks, and they took out this water diversion that had been there forever, didn't need it anymore. It was actually more expensive to maintain uh, the dam than it was to just buy water from Snohomish County. So that's what they did. They took it out. And now Chinook can uh, return in greater numbers and to parts of that watershed they haven't been in for a century. So, you know, this is the kind of work that we can do and know how to do and are doing all over the region. We just need to do a lot more of it. Yeah. I mean, there there are a few questions now. Um, there's one from Aaron. What do you say um, the lower snake dams are the biggest priority for dam removal? You know, it's very interesting. The science on this is clear. It, these dams, the, the Columbia Basin is, is very extensively developed, right? I mean, there's, there are dams, large and small, all over the Columbia Basin. These four dams were among the last built. Well, they were the last built on the main stem. And they were the last one, Lower Granite, which is the inlandmost, was finished in 1976. And you, and you see a dive in these salmon populations. Uh, ever since you know we've had some good years uh 2015 was a really big year there were like a million fish that came back but remember that's a tenth of what it used to be i mean it this the, the decline has been steady and over time and and with climate uh the wipeouts are the the time between the bad years is getting shorter and we've we've been seeing near record lows recently and so what is it about the lower snake river dams why do people say that they're the problem well, it's eight dams instead of instead of four. And so the thinking is that if you took out those four dams, these fish would have just four less dams to contend with. And you know, is it the silver bullet? Is it the only thing? No, it's not the only thing. As I've talked about today, uh, you have historic overfishing, you have overdevelopment and uh, destruction of of the freshwater habitat. You've got hatcheries, which can can have a negative influence on wild fish. And then you, but you do have the hydro system. And, and while dam passage has been made safer for these fish than it's ever been, you're still losing a, a chunk of the, of the run at every single dam times eight. It adds up. And that's before you even get to the sea. And so right now there's a, a very, um, a, a really new moment in our region's history. We have a senator, a Republican actually from Idaho named Mike Simpson, who stepped forward with a proposal to try, try to grab a piece of this uh, infrastructure bill that's in the U.S. Congress or may make it to the U.S. Congress, depending on what the Biden administration decides to do, uh, and try to try to grab billions of dollars to basically rebuild um, the economy of the Northwest region, where it depends on these lower Snake River dams, buy replacement power, uh, replace the navigation system, improve the distribution system for electricity, make a real investment to modernize the grid, modernize uh, the transportation system, take out the four dams, restore the fisheries, and and bring uh, a different kind of prosperity to this region. Um, the Nez Perce tribe and 
57 tribes from all over the region, from Northern California to Western Montana to Southeast Alaska have endorsed this. They, they want to see something happen for these fish. And they're going to be convening a Salmon Orca Summit this summer, uh, which I'm sure will be open to the public. So watch the newspaper for news about that. Um, you know, the tribes are making it clear that it, it's time to see some action for these fish. And and so far, Mike Simpson has not gotten a dance partner from Northwest delegation. Uh, Patty Murray and Maria Cantwell have taken a step back from this and said that we need to do something, but not necessarily this. And they want to convene a process to figure out what it should be. Uh, Governor Inslee, similarly, they, they say dam removal should be on the table still, but you know, they don't endorse the Simpson proposal. So this is all in flux right now. It's going to be a huge summer of salmon and orca and dams. And I, and I hope this book can help inform the debate. It's, it's based on the science and the history of this environmental crisis. And it's a good way for people to inform themselves. You know, I often get the question, well, what should I do? What can I do? Well, number one is be aware. Be aware that you share this region with salmon and orcas. You know, you don't want to be like California, where after a long day on the water, I went into a restaurant um, and ordered a salad and some, had about six glasses of water. And the, the waitress, she looked at my credit card. She said, oh, Seattle Times, what, why are you down here? What are you doing in California? And I said, oh, we're doing a story about orcas and salmon. And she said, oh, well, I don't get cable, so I don't know anything about that. You know, she didn't even know that she had salmon in the Sacramento River. She didn't even know that the orcas came down all the way to where she lives. And I'm not ragging on her. I'm just saying that the day that you no longer know that you're living in salmon and orca country, Washington state is going to be a very different place if that day ever comes. So awareness is job one. Inform yourself. Talk to your neighbors. Uh, talk to your elected officials. Make sure they know you care. Yeah, definitely. Um, Betsy has a question. Um, where exactly were you when you went to view the northern whales? Right. So we uh, we stayed at Alert Bay, which is a native village. And uh, and when we, we were all over the Broughton Archipelago, which is a chain of islands around the northeast, off the northeast side of Vancouver Island. And we, we got there by taking a seaplane from Seattle um, to the mainland up there. And then we crossed, we met a boat uh Rob Williams of Oceans Initiative and his wife, Erin Ash, were doing field work and they were kind enough to pick us up and take us around where we needed to go. And we spent days and days up there with uh, Paul Spong and Rob Williams looking for orcas and learning about what their life was like up there. And it it was a transformational experience for me, honestly, to see all that wildlife. One of the first things that happened when we headed out with Rob was there was this unbelievable stampede of white dolphins all around us. I mean, you could hear them. They were just churning the water. There were so many of them just racing over the surface of the water. And then we instantly encountered this big pod of northern killer whales. We weren't even trying to see them. We weren't even ready to see them. We hadn't even unpacked our gear. <laughs> it's like, oh my <laughs> God, they're here. We're here. It, it was such a moment, really. Uh, it was um, bittersweet. It was sweet because it was exciting and beautiful, but it was like, you know, this is what it should be like where we live too. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned to me before before we started that sometimes it's hard to stay focused on the, the note taking. It's just, <laughs> you're in the moment just yeah. with these animals. Just, yeah, their yeah. <laughs> imminence is, is so overwhelming. You know, people would say to me, are they afraid of you? It's like, ha, huh, are you kidding? I mean, <laughs> They're the king of the sea. They've they've been around for thirteen thousand years. Yeah. <laughs> you're, it's shocking to see them up. You know, when you're out on the water, they're so big, they're so fast, they're so athletic, and and even from shore, which is another way to see them. There's a whole whale trail. Go online and, and check that out. The whale trail. It's it's a great way to see the whales. They, you know, they come right up to shore when you're on San Juan Island at Lime Kiln Park. It's uh, so you don't have to sh you don't have to go out in a boat, you can see them right from shore. And down here in West Seattle, people see them right from the beach at places like Makeway Mooks Park and Constellation Park. It's, and that's the thing, you know, downtown orcas, who else has got that? That That's pretty special. That's really yeah. worth working to try to keep. Definitely. Um, Kim, Kim has an interesting question. Um, does the Puget Sound not have pebbled floored beaches like the Strait of Georgia? Or is it's it just that the they're like kind of over 
overtaken by humans kind of yeah so two things about that uh the northern residents have passed this culture down generation to generation and it's something they do and these pebble beaches you know honestly as i think about it that's a great question i can't think of beaches that i've seen like that in puget sound country um they must exist but i feel like it's either rocky or it's sandy but this kind of deeply piled polished deep pebbles that are about the size of your thumb anybody out there on this call can they think of a place like that um i can't really so I'm maybe not sure that is, i can yeah i can't either sound so, right so least. maybe it is unique up there but it, for sure the culture is passed down and the southern residents don't do this they don't you know go up and rub on oyster shells or something <laughs> So it's interesting, you know, they have their particular uh, language. Each pod has some calls that only it makes. Uh, they have customs and culture, and they also have a greeting ceremony. There'll be a time sometimes in the summer when all three pods will come together and they'll just erupt in, mm -hmm. in sharing of, you know, their language. And it sounds like a calliope with all these voices and there's a lot of play and frisking around and, you know, it, it, it really is right to think about them as a society with culture. And for the northern residents, that's just a way that they, they enjoy themselves. And the underwater footage of it, if you go to explore.org, which is where we got that picture that I showed, it's luscious footage. You can't even believe it. I mean, you just watch them scooch low over the stones and rub their bellies. It, it's quite spectacular. Yeah. Um, I'm going to read this question from Mary. I'm not sure... I 100% understand what's asking, but I'm just going to read it and sure. maybe you'll... We'll figure um, it out. Are you willing to comment on the Idaho Republicans proposal that doesn't seem to have garnered support? It right. seems like a radical departure from what's been seen as the constraints and depends on everyone in the various affected areas getting together as with ELWA and pushing for access to Biden's massive infrastructure proposal. Feels like we're letting this opportunity go by. Right. This is exactly what I was talking about earlier. This is the Simpson proposal. I wrote a big story about this um, and a couple stories about it. So if you go to the Seattle Times and search my byline, Simpson, Salmon, you'll see it. You'll see them. And this is an ongoing breaking story. I mean, we'll we'll see how this is going to come out. It's um, it's interesting to me, you know, the, the when the senior delegation came out and opposed this, you didn't see the tribes just kind of say, oh, okay, you know, quite the opposite. They came right back and said, well, actually, we think you do need to look at this and now's the time and we can't let this opportunity go by. And in fact, we're going to convene a Salmon Orca Summit right here in the Northwest and talk about it. And I was startled by that. They went further than that. They also said they didn't want the federal government to spend any money defending the biological opinion that upholds the continued operation of the status quo of the dams, saying that that was uh, reached under the Trump administration and wasn't good science. So, you know, wow. So they're, they've, they've put it on the table. They're keeping it on the table. The congressman is barnstorming around. It's it is not over. It's it's far from over, and it's going to be a very interesting summer for salmon and orca. And it, it's a good time to be informed and be engaged. Yeah. Um, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, there's two more. Um, I think we have time for. Um, one is. Um. Oh, I lost it. Okay. Yes. What is your feeling about the whale watching boats? It seems like a great way for the public to see and feel the whales, but is it worth it? So whale watching is really important for the whales in the sense that it is a gateway to appreciating the spectacular marine wife. I've gone out on some of these whale, whale watch boats uh, for the paper. It's very interesting, you know, maybe it's just because I'm there, but but they're very careful. Um, they stay way back. They cut their engines. They, they follow the law uh, when I'm there. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, and it, it's very profitable and, and people come from around the world to do this. I mean, it's it's big business. And interestingly, um, it's continued to to increase in business, uh, pandemic aside. But, you know, the numbers have been steadily increasing in, in whale watching, even as the restrictions have been putting the whale watch boats further and further away. So people still enjoy it. They still want to go. Uh, the big debate has been whether the southern residents should be watched. You know, there's there's lots of whales out there. There's more whales than in a generation. Humpbacks, gray whales, transients. It's fantastic. You know, you, you go out on one of these boats, you're going to see a whale. There's no question you're going to see some kind of whale. 
Um, but should they be watching the Southern residents? Well, WDFW just went through their first rulemaking, uh, made the first regulations for this industry. And, and what they came out with was kind of a compromise. Basically what they said was, you know, we're, we're, we want people to stay back, further back than even the federal rules require. And furthermore, if, if a Southern resident is um, doing poorly, if it's thin, if, it, if we know it to be in trouble, you, you're to stay away from that family. You're not to not to engage, not to watch at all. If there's a baby and you're up to one year old, again, you're supposed to just like turn around, and leave. You know, it, it's interesting. We, it's all going to be in in two things. One, the monitoring and the enforcement. Right? Will there be WDFW on the water to watch? Secondly, will we will we monitor as we promised to see how this affects the whales you know does it make a difference are these are these rules helping we know that speed is directly related to sound uh the faster the boat the louder the boat uh very interestingly there's um some work underway right now by john durbin and holly fernbach to monitor the health condition of these whales by drone photography so we can know in real time how the southern residents are doing are they stressed are there animals that are looking thin that people can stay should stay away from so we have the capacity to monitor their condition and act accordingly um, there are also some really interesting industrial scale developments the ports of vancouver um, and seattle are joining in a voluntary slowdown for uh, really big ships again to try okay. to to quiet the 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 water. So that actually is relevant to the the next question I had, which is, um, is the U.S. and Canada collaborating to nurture the Chinook? Um, so, but it sounds like they are collaborating with whale watching. Um, you know, it's interesting. Canada has gone further than we have to protect the southern residents. They don't. Um, they've 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 basically agree in Canada that if you encounter a, a pod of Southern residents, you're supposed to turn around and go away and you're not supposed to market tours of Southern residents. They've also enacted uh, fisheries restrictions uh, in, in important feeding areas for these whales. It was only recently with WDFW that some of these areas like the San Juan Island West side have been closed to whale watching in the summer. And so, you know, we see this increasing um, regulatory effort to try to, you know, get people to stay back, keep back. You know, frankly, I think some of the biggest problem isn't the professional whale watch cruises who know they're being watched by everybody. It, it's the Joe six pack. It's the uninformed boater out there just cruising around. And during the pandemic, so many people decided to go get themselves a boat and head out to the water and go buzz around without any idea, you know, where the whales were, or if there was a whale. And, um, you know, this is these whales. There are only 75 of them and they're so fragile and they're under so much stress. You know, you got to really ask yourself, do you, do you need to, do you need to go anywhere near them? Can you just let them go have their day? <laughs> yeah. So and whale watching definitely has a place in, in people staying engaged with these whales, but you really have to think about um, whale watching on the Southern residents. And I, and I think, you know, most of the professionals, they, they do a good job. They're following the law, but it's, you know how people are. They always want to push it. They want to get that photo. Mm -hmm. These animals, they're under so much stress and they're only 75. And like people you need said, to give them space. Like you said, there's one of the best things we can do is, is to be aware, um, which is especially important um, with all the people moving here. Like you said, they're not going to stop. Um, they might not even know anything <laughs> about right. our the orcas and the the chinook the different kinds of salmon and are right yeah. right and to mary shackleford whose uh q a i just saw pop up why aren't we dancing with this so very disappointing you know mary tell your electeds uh governor jay Inslee, mary cantwell um patty murray they need to know how you feel and not only you but your neighbors and you know it's a funny thing you wouldn't believe the power of the handwritten letter in an envelope with an actual stamp. <laughs> Nobody gets a real letter anymore, right? You get a letter, you feel some figure somebody died. So use your voice. Send an actual letter that you wrote yourself at your kitchen table and put a stamp on it and mail it to your elected officials and tell them you're paying attention to this. You really care about this. You want something to happen, if that's how you feel. Um, and and so Mary, you know this this is a big summer for this topic and. If you've got feelings about it now is the time to let people know i know i personally would much be much more interested in a letter than another email <laughs> oh yeah another email yeah. or a robo postcard or like mm. you know that stuff i i, I just 
Yeah. And I can't even imagine if you're an elected, how much of that kind of junk you get. It must just be overwhelming. But mm. an actual um, reach out by a real person to you, you're going to notice that. Yeah. And, you know, even appreciate it that there's an actual human connection. But it does sound like um, the U.S. and Canada policies are are separate for the most oh, part. Oh, yeah. They are separate. But you know what? I, I don't want to give Canada a pass. I mean... Mm -hmm. Beautiful, natural British Columbia. They're whacking old growth. They're cutting old growth forests right across the Strait of Juan de Fuca from Port Angeles in a very, in very, very special um, uncut stands. You know, they're still logging old growth commercially. We don't do that in this country. We haven't done that since, since the Northwest Forest Plan. You know, old growth on federal land that we're not cutting that, but they're cutting it in BC. They're cutting it right now. And not only that, but the Trans Mountain Pipeline, right? They're doubling the capacity of that pipeline, which is going to seven times the tanker traffic right through that primary whale habitat. Um, you know, and they've, you know, the Trans Mountain Pipeline, the company that's building that, which by now is Canada, right? They nationalized the project. They assure everyone it's going to be safe and all that. It's, it's just, again, you know, there are only 75 whales left, 75 Southern residents. And even the Canadian government, when they, uh, when they examined that project, they made the determination that the Salish Sea is already so noisy that even a small increment in noise would hurt the survival chances for the Southern residents. But they decided it was in the Canadian national interest, so they do it anyway, and they are. And now there's also a new container port being uh, looked at right in the Fraser River Delta. So it's just more, 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 and that's all going on in Canada. So I, I don't want to give them a pass. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it does, so working together, U.S. and Canada is definitely something that would help. Oh, the these are transboundary animals, of course. Mm -hmm. It would yeah. help the salmon. It would help the orcas. I mean, let's face it: the boundary is a, it's a human construct, and and the first people of this place don't recognize it either. You know, mm -hmm. their families continue on both sides of the border and their cultures, and this border, um, it's meaningless to the first people and the first beings of this place. And, and to the extent we do not observe the connected transboundary region of the Salish Sea, we're, we're hurting these animals and we're hurting the cause of, of recovery. Yeah. Well, I think that's all the questions we have time for today, unfortunately, but thank you so much to our audience for joining us today. You had some wonderful questions and thank you, Linda, you're, so very knowledgeable on this topic and it was uh inspiring to hear um that the, they're still fighting those 75 whales <laughs> they and, are in the southern in the southern pods um yeah um do you have any any final words linda at all I do. Uh, because you're up there in Bellingham, home of Western Washington University, I want to give a shout out to the Salish Sea Institute. Uh, they just published their most recent report on the state of the Salish Sea. It's available online and it is the most up-to-date science on the Salish Sea. And I really encourage uh, people listening tonight to read it, share it. Um, it's, it's a wonderful compendium of what we know about salmon, about orcas and the state of the Salish Sea today. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I sent the link to the Village Books website where you could find orcas um, in the chat, as well as the link to the Village Books YouTube channel. So you may rewatch this event uh, once it's uploaded or send it to your friends or watch any of our past events. Um, and thank you again for joining us today. Thank you so much to Linda um, and have a great night, everyone. Thank you, Ditali. Thank you, Village Books. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.